There's another way to visualize a decision tree, and that is to look at the, uh, the vector space, um, how it's divided up by the classifier, regardless of whether we have a training um, point at, at each point or not. Let's just classify every point in the input space. So this little bit of code does that. Um, we, we find the maximum and minimum along each of the dimensions. Um, here we're going to divide each dimension up into 40 increments. And then we're going to just generate, for each of the points within that 40 by 40 space, uh, we call this function treeval. So this will evaluate the tree at this point, and uh, it returns the class that it's assigned to. So if it's class 1, we'll plot a red dot. If it's 2, a green dot, and otherwise a blue dot. So this is how the space is divided up, um, where we have the x dimension here, y dimension here. Each point now is assigned a red, green, or blue, depending on what the tree says it should be. So um, as you can see, the, uh, we, I believe the uh, class 1 was more or less up in the upper left-hand corner here, as, as is captured. Class 2 and 3 were kind of intermixed down here. So one thing about the decision tree is that it, um, it does tend to generalize, although if there is any point at all, it will try to um, capture that value here. Uh, you can control the degree of generalization somewhat um, using this parameter split min to the tree fit function. So split min has default value 10, and it indicates the number of incorrect samples that the tree will tolerate before it splits a node. So for example, if you set split min equal to 1, it will cause the decision tree to split if there are any instances not correctly labeled. So here I've, um, the, the previous example was uh, split min of 10. This is split min of 1. So you can see it's a more um, uh, detailed tree. It's more complicated. And it's, it's doing this because now every example in the input training set is correctly labeled. And here is the, um, the dividing up of the input vector space using that tree. And as you can see, it's more detailed than the previous one. And if you compare it to the original set of training vectors, you can map every one of these correctly. Um, for example, this, this green dot right here is captured by this, um, this stripe over here and so forth. Just to experiment with that, we can have more generalization by increasing split min. Um, this has split min of 20, so we wind up with a simpler tree and a simpler divvying up of the input feature space. And here is a split min of 40, which is even simpler. All right, let's look at a different type of classifier now. This is a very simple one that just looks at the nearest class mean. So again, we take our input training vectors. Here we compute the mean of, of each class, and we store that. And then we just um, take an input, a new point, and we figure out which one it's closer to. So we could use the Euclidean distance for that. Um, a problem, though, is that if the um, classes are not uniformly distributed about the mean. So for example, here I have class 3, which is very elongated vertically. And a point that is close to the top of that uh, class 3 group might actually, um, it actually might belong to class 3, but it might actually be, wind up being closer to class 2. So a way to handle this is to scale the uh, Euclidean distance by the standard deviation along each of the dimensions for, for, for each class. Um, if the um, ellipses are not aligned with the axes, so they're correlated, they're, the dimensions are not independent, then we can use the covariance. 
So recall that a co the variance is defined this way for a single variable. The covariance, say for two dimensions, would be a two by two matrix. And it is defined um, using this. So the cross covariance would be the, um, the deviations of x and y multiplied together. So just an example of a two dimensional set of vectors here is a covariance matrix of a set of vectors that, that is more or less independent, so the off-diagonal is very little. Here is a set of vectors that are highly correlated, um, and as you can see, the off-diagonal elements are fairly large. Um, and we can interpret the covariance as a probability if we assume that the errors are Gaussian. So the probability density for a two-dimensional error vector x is given by this two-dimensional Gaussian here. Again, C is the covariance matrix. Um, and the, if we look at the exponent of, the, um, of this function here, this value here, um, and look at where that's a constant. That's the equation of an ellipse. For example, we take delta x is a two-dimensional vector, say x, y. Here's our covariance matrix a, b, c, d. Multiplying that out, we get an expression like this, um, which is in the form of an equation of an ellipse. If the off-diagonal elements are 0, the b and c are 0, this simply reduces to um, this simpler form of the ellipse here. So we can plot um, contours of, of constant probability if we, if we set the, um, the exponent to a constant. For example, z equals 3 would capture about 97% of the cumulative probability. Um, and here's some contours of constant probability uh, for those two cases. And this just is some MATLAB code that um, displays that. Um, the highlights here, I call the COV function to find the covariance. Um, here's where it plots the um, probability density function called f of x. And finally, um, contour is plotted using MATLAB's contour function. As an example, looking again at that flower data from MATLAB, um, here I'm going to look at features 3 and 4. Remember that flower data actually had four features per observation. Um, here I'll use the, the, uh, the two that are at the end. So plotting all those points, um, I get a um, plot like this. If I uh, compute the covariance of, let's say, class 1, um, I uh, use the COV function and plot contours of constant probability here. So as you can see, the uh, class 1 is tightly uh, grouped, so the probability has a, has a nice isolated peak over here. And similarly, I could, I could plot the contours of probability for these other two classes. And then, again, for a, a new point, I can test to see which um, which value it's closest to. And that brings us to that distance called the Mahalanobis distance. So given a unknown point x, which class is it closest to? So assuming I know the class centers and their covariances, um, I compute the distance weighted by the covariance. So this is the exponent of that um, Gaussian uh, PDF function. So um, I have the inverse, the uh, inverse of the covariance function sigma, and here is x is my unknown point, and xc is the center that I'm trying to um, test with. 